Hello and welcome to the Dev Doom Bear Podcast. My name's Sean and joining me as always is the one and only Dante Boffer, Mr. Boffer, my man. How are we? Sean, I'm so good. That's good. But I want to know how you are. I'm wonderful. I am absolutely wonderful. Um, as we messaged earlier in the day, we're saying, all right, pod, you know, let's get the energy going. And you were like, oh, the energy isn't quite there. I slept in a bit, late to work. At the time, there were clouds all over the sky and it was were. very depressing. Um, but... You know, the, the clouds have parted. It's quite literally a blue sky with a nice little brisk breeze and the sun's shining. So we got our vitamin D fix and now we're, we're fucking, was it, cheery-eyed and something-something? Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. That's the one. Well, we are. And I just want to take credit for this because I actually did manifest the weather changing. And then when the sun came out mid-afternoon, I manifested it staying out. So <laughs> <coughs> everyone in uh, Melbourne, you're welcome. Um... But it's bloody good to be back. We had a week off last week. Because uh, we were both under D- the weather. DNP illness. <laughs> um, Non-COVID illness. Non-COVID illness. So it's it's good to be back in the saddle with you, mate. <sighs> Likewise. And uh, also, happy birthday for yesterday. Oh, thank you. What did you, what did you get up to? Uh, well, I worked all day, which awesome. is absolutely dour. <laughs> but uh, they, got me, they got me a nice cake and... Um, Went for dinner with the family in the evening, got some, some vegan pizza, which was lovely, and got the present of Lionel Messi advancing to the World Cup final uh, yesterday morning with yeah, a 3 right. 0 Argentina win against Croatia. So, you know, it was a nice day, all in all. Yeah, wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> Um, all right, well, uh, let's just go through the housekeeping before we get into the podcast. Um, first of all, if you head to the deep com, the deep com, the deep com, it's that simple. That's really fucking simple. T H E D E E P T W O dot com, um, where you can find all of our long form articles, short form articles, podcasts, uh, and just pretty pictures made by yours truly. Um, but there was an article up there from the JVG's very own. Um, Marco Holden Jeffrey, who wrote an article on Larry Markin and, and looking at how good of a star is Larry Markin because he's doing something great for the Utah Jazz right now. But is he good enough to be the best player on a playoff team, the best player on something potentially better, or is he eventually going to fall off and maybe we're left with something a little less than the best player on a playoff team? But I won't spoil it too much. Um, how high can the Larry Bird fly is on the deep two com. Second piece of business: who you got for the mic? Who have I got for the mic? Yeah, who you got for the mic this year? What do you mean? Who you got for the mic? Oh, jeez. The Michael Jordan trophy. Oh, shit. Because <laughs> oh, that's, that's the lingo. That's how we say it now, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Uh, well, the lingo is still yet to be decided. The internet obviously had had takes on, on the NBA uh, introducing new... Uh, names for each award named after NBA legends. Uh, but I think the true lingo will take time to develop. Yeah. You know how, like, the start of COVID, like... We were saying SARS-2 novel coronavirus, every mention. <laughs> there you go. Exactly right. When <laughs> isolation started being a thing, like, it was months before people were... Before ISO was ingrained in the cultural lexicon. So I think that's going to be the same thing with this Mm. but I do think it's a mistake really do you think it's it's a mistake is it potentially because players are still playing players are still great right now yeah 35 years from now after all the old books you're locking out LeBron James from Mm. ever having a fucking award named after him (laughs) because you've given fucking George Mike and (laughs) and John Havlicek Awards, you know, like Pistol John, you know. <laughs> my favourite joke. <laughs> it's Pistol Pete and Pistol John. I don't know, one of them played for the Hawks. <laughs> you know, like uh, I, I just feel like there's an entire half century of yeah. NBA history that is like locked out. You yeah. think that, but then when I think George Mikan, I think most improved. <laughs> um, so who who you got for the mic this year? Who got for Sorry, the mic? Mike being most improved. Who I got for the mic this year? Well, I picked named, named after Mike. And- yeah. I uh, I actually picked Tyrese Maxey, so <laughs> um, needless to say, it probably won't be him. Who who knows? I actually have not thought about um, awards. awards, considering that most teams have played twenty three games. Yeah, well, I I think about awards every day when I wake up because one specific award I slapped my name on it and I squished it together um, and I've just been walking around with that award everywhere which is Bones Highland in the six man of the year conversation 
Um, I still reckon he'll be in the conversation. He'll be in the top five by the end of the year. <laughs> yeah. But, oh, fuck, I'd love if he could create his shot a little better. Yeah. Well, should we stop <laughs> having a laugh then? What's Just do- before we move on, though, did you know that <laughs> Bones Highland's family died in a fire? In yeah, 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 I was aware. Anyway, so let's talk about the topic of this episode. Um, are the Chicago Bulls stuck on the treadmill of mediocrity? Um, and what happens to the Chicago Bulls? Can this can this season be redeemed? Just how are we feeling? Testing the waters. How are we feeling about the Chicago Bulls right now? Um, I'll give them their numbers. They're currently eleven and sixteen, which for those counting at home, that's five games under five hundred. They're eleventh in the Eastern Conference, and for those still counting at home, ten teams get to start a game that starts with play, being the play-in tournament. Or the playoffs. Um, they lost today against the Knicks. Did you see Julius Randle's um, hold the ball for 20 seconds down the end of regulation? No, I didn't. So 21 seconds to go. Julius Randle's got the, the ball at the top of the three-point line with Patrick Williams on him. You know, you'd say Chicago's preferred defender mm. on the guy with the ball. And he sat there. He sort of spat it in his hand a little bit, took a jab, waved off a screen, waved off a cutter, waved off everything. 21 seconds, turns into five seconds. Jabs, dribble, dribble. You know, escape dribble, escape dribble, and then he's shooting a fadeaway behind the backboard and airballed it. And they went that to- all sounds pretty Julius Randle. <laughs> and after all that, he was still the guy that the NBA Instagram account used his photo and stat line. Because um, he had a good game. Because he had a good game, but yeah. just goes to show. Don't, <laughs> don't check your phone after a game. Don't fucking let the, the NBA Instagram account's chosen stat line and photo dictate your impression of a player's game. So the Knicks beat the Bulls, but before today's games, just going off their stats from yesterday, they have a 0.0 point differential, which is incredible, um, which was 17th in the league Is as that well. the definition of m- mediocrity? <laughs> Um, 17th in the league per cleaning the glass. Uh, they have the 20th best offense and the 9th best defense. I will note that we were going to record this episode and talk about this topic last week before we had a DNP uh, illness, non-COVID. Um, those figures are slightly better than where they were last week. They had two wins in this past week, one against the Wizards, one against the Mavs, but then lost to the Hawks at the buzzer in that AJ Griffin weird turnaround buzzer beater. It's going to be the weirdest buzzer beater I've seen in a long time. AJ Griffin has had two buzzer beating layups in his in his one year career, He's which is quite 20, interesting. He's played 26 games. <laughs> Quite interesting. Um, that's not really something you want to get known for, but I mean, good on him for making the shots. <laughs> um, Cold blooded in the layup front. Um, Billy Donovan. There are some people calling for Billy Donovan's job um, at the start of the season. Once the the Bulls' offense looked very stagnant, um, then Arturis Karnasovas came out and said, "Oh, by the way, in the off season, we actually signed him to an extension." Um, why didn't we tell you in the off season? It seems like a PR layup. Like, why wouldn't you just say, "Hey, the coach that brought us back to the playoffs for the first time in four years, I believe." Um, why wouldn't you just announce immediately that you've just signed your dude to an extension if if you like that coach? I don't know. Why would you announce it as soon as people start calling for his job? Even weirder. Um, we have Zach Levine, who signed a Heat's Max this offseason, but also had arthroscopic knee surgery after signing the contract. Hasn't looked as explosive as he has in the past, and obviously without that explosion, he's missing some of his jump shots. Demar Rosen still having an excellent season, continuing on his renaissance from renaissance from last year. Um, but really, this team at the end of the day is 11 and 6 with some very expensive players with some pick obligations that make you 11, quite scared. 11 and 16. Sorry, 11 and 16. 11 and 6 would be fucking great. <laughs> but Dante, how are you feeling about this Chicago Bulls team right now? I mean, you can't be feeling anything but trepidatious looking at the quality of the on court product, which has not been good. Uh, and, you know, like you mentioned, looking forward to the future in terms of an, an asset um, an asset and roster management mindset, you're relying on your two best players in DeRozan and Levine, one of whom is 33 and one of whom you've mentioned is coming back from arthroscopic knee surgery. There are legitimate questions anyway on how good a team with Zach Levine as their best player is going to be. Um and the fact that they have kind of whiffed on creating this big three because the inclusion of Nick Vucevic on, you know, even outside of the asset 
play, which was which is revealing itself to have been quite bad, considering that they <coughs> gave away Wendell Carter Jr. and two first round picks, plus um, plus salary to bring him to town. That's bad. But the on court product has been bad as well, and their big three just aren't gelling. Which the only real other scenario in the league where that's happening where you've got like your three highest paid players ostensibly your three best players who just aren't performing well together is the Lakers with their big three mm. um, and that's not company that you want to be keeping when you're talking <laughs> about big threes but um, this season when Levine, DeRozan and Vucevic share the floor they've got a minus 6.3 net rating which is really bad um, and that's in quite a large sample size mm. Um, we're talking over 500 minutes this season when they've shared the floor. So that is like the crux of the problem because you, you're not going to be sustainably good when your three best players like are bad on the floor. Mm. You can finagle and fiddle around with lineups and stagger so that DeRozan and Vucevic don't share the court together as much and the mid-range doesn't get all gummed up. You can do bits and bobs, but like your 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 nucleus needs to be complementary. Yeah, and I can't think outside of the Lakers of a team that has a less complementary nucleus than the Bulls. Mm-hmm, definitely, and usually when you see these teams that have a really a really good and expensive top end, it's like the Golden State Warriors, amazing starting lineup, but their bench just isn't getting it done. And we saw today, goal, um, Stephen Curry at halftime against the Indiana Pacers, he had scored twenty seven points, and he's sitting on the court just like exhausted because his team's down by twenty, and it's like okay. How can the rest of the team just prop this guy up? You look at somewhere like the Denver Nuggets, where it's as soon as Nikola Jokic sits, everyone's looking around like, fuck, how do we how do we put the ball in the basket? It's like, that's because your best bits are doing an amazing thing and you just need to figure out how to do it, do it when they're gone. But with the Bulls, like like you said, they're not succeeding at what should be their best bits. Um, and they're you know almost definitely not succeeding when their best bits are sitting. Um, it's just... It's just so depressing. Like you said at the start, the, the first thing you said, it's just so such a, a bad situation to be in. Um, and I wrote an article this morning for PippinAneasy.com, the Bulls fan site website, and I pretty much said that the Bulls are at a fork in the road right now. And we've, we've seen it before, and Kevin O'Connor of The Ringer has done a good job of pointing it out, saying like, okay, look, right now, the bottom six teams are all, or bottom five teams are all tanking for Wembenyana. They're going to do a great job of doing that. Like Josh Richardson for the Spurs, mm. hit like a couple of threes. Next game, he's got knee soreness. He's sitting. Yeah. Like we don't want you to even think about getting on a hot streak. Um, so like these bottom teams are definitely pulling away in the in the negative way. And then you've got a couple of teams stuck in the middle. That's like the the Wizards, the Indiana Pacers who are overperforming a little bit, the Chicago Bulls who are underperforming a little bit. They need to decide, are they going to tear it down, which is something that you know I feel like every podcaster talks about, no matter what year, what team, whoever's just underperforming, tear it down. Or are they going to push their chips in a little bit further, dig themselves a little bit more of a hole and say, no, nah, we, we have to make the playoffs because that's just what we want to do. Um, it just gets a little bit tricky because in trading for Nikola Vucevic, they gave up the pick that became Franz Wagner. They gave up Wendell Carter Jr., who looks fine. And they gave up this year's pick, but it's top four protected. So if the Bulls do somehow manage to get the worst record, I know you, you're guaranteed a top four pick, but um, the Bulls, even if they tear it down and tank and try and say, okay, well, look, it hasn't worked. We're going to trade away all our guys. Let's just go do it. And then maybe we can get Victor Wembanyama. If their pick falls fifth, they just don't get it. So mm-hmm. all of a sudden you've teared it down. You've got nothing to build off apart from Pat Williams and, you know, my tongue-in-cheek thoughts of Pat Williams, but Pat Williams is not dragging you to the glory land. So it's such a depressing situation. They've just got rocks and hard places all around them. Yeah, you, you realistically, you know, with, with a team like... A team like Utah in the off-season, the discourse was always around, you're tearing it down, you're getting all these valuable picks in return, but you're increasing the value of your own pick, which is going to be your greatest asset in the near future. Um, obviously, this team doesn't have that um, ability. But it, in you know, outside of that, in, in in tearing it down, if they decided to pivot out of this and trade away their stars, try and get picks and young players back, um, you pro- you wouldn't Im- you know improve your chances meaningfully of of retaining that pick this year because there are already some quite bad teams. Um, so that's a major risk. You would obviously get picks back, but you wouldn't get a lot back because Vucevic has. 
not really any trade value unless you're talking about the Lakers and you're taking Russell Westbrook's contract back because the Lakers are the only team that he has been really rumoured to be moving to. DeRozan is in the same boat, both with being rumoured to the Lakers and also, you know, no one is... Even though DeMar is playing at an all-star level Mm. this year and coming off an all-NBA second-team appearance last year, no one is really laying down, like, the assets that you would want... For, for a player of his level considering that he is 33, he's 33 years, old. years old and he can be somewhat of a difficult pick because he's a difficult fit because his skills and his weaknesses are so de- defined mm. but they pose problems for a lot of teams but but even if like okay we know who Damari is let's just get him in you're not sure he's going to be an all level talent for at least one more year on top of this but like you would you would want to lay down the assets to get maybe five years of production you're not no one's given the Bulls two first round picks for DeMar. Definitely not. And yeah. if you're a team that's saying we're going to tear it down, we're going to trade our best player, and you're not even getting two first round picks, it's, that's the, the juice isn't worth the squeeze to do that. Yeah. And then Levine, you know, having a kind of a down year after two awesome years, mm. still a really good player, and you have every you know confidence that the best years of his career are ahead of him, and he'll get his you know explosiveness and his rhythm back. Mm. Um, and he has had some games this year where he's looked really good. He dropped 41 a couple of weeks ago on the Kings, looked really smooth. But his value as an, as an all-time low, you know, mm. at least over the last few seasons. So you're talking about rocks and hard places. They can't really turn back. They can't really look to pivot out of this. But it is becoming clearer by the week that, that this team is not good enough realistically to even challenge for a top six spot in the East. Mm. That seems already, you know, we're, we're 27 games through their season. That already seems out of reach. Mm. And you mentioned uh, Patrick Williams before. And in thinking about this team, I can't help but think that if Patrick Williams had become anything resembling what everyone seemed to think he could become, that it might be different mm. because he's the, the prototype build and like defensive flexible defensively flexible player mm. that you want from your like big switchy combo forward can play the four in small lineups can play the three in big lineups he just has not developed anything offensively like he the only nice the only positive from his game this year that that we've seen is that he's shooting the ball really well he's shooting 40% from three but he's taking like two threes a game mm. and there are so many times where the D is just not even closing out on him. Mm. You're looking at the scouting report and your coach is saying, this guy's a 40% shoot, three-point shooter. Close out on him. They're not closing out on him because they just don't think he's going to shoot it because well, he's so I mean, reluctant to put the ball in the hoop. But Billy Donovan also doesn't think he's going to shoot it because Javante Green's been starting a lot of the season as well. Like He's been flip-flopping between like who's the starting power forward there. But it's just, yeah, it's 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 so bad. And you talk about how this team doesn't look to be a top six seed, like a team that can dodge the play in. The last time they were a top six seed, they unluckily, but <coughs> you're the six seed, so this just happens. You played the third seed, who are the Milwaukee Bucks, and they just absolutely stomped them. Like, they, did they beat them in five games? I think they gifted them one. And it was, like, awesome. DeMar DeRozan had a great game in that game that they won. Um, but at the end of the day, you are nowhere near the upper echelon of the East. Um, and I think, like... Arturis Karnaschovas has said that he just wants to to make the second round. Um, I I don't know if that's on the record. I don't know if that was reading between the lines for for the report I was reading today. But if his goal is to make the second round in the playoffs, I don't even know if this team can do it. I think this team is just a playoff team. This this team can't do it because, you know, in, in addition to talking about the big three and in addition to talking about Pat Williams not developing... None of their role players are playing in a, you know, are the sort of player that's like elevating people around them. Their role players are like, their role players are actually good, but they're just, they're simultaneously not solving any problems and not offering you enough. They're, they're very much just replacement level. Like they brought in Andre Drummond and Goran Dragic and Goran Dragic, I think his best day is definitely behind him. Andre Drummond is just being a replacement level backup. Ayo Donsumnu is playing really well. I really like him. Drafting the second round, extreme value. But he is he's, just... He's, he's an just energy, a he's an, good he's an energy, backup point guard. An energy like backup he, guard. He's not, a, he's not a difference maker yet, anyway. Yeah. Alex, Cru- Alex Caruso has having the worst... I drafted him in fantasy because I thought he was just going to at least chuck in a couple of threes and get some steals. Alex Caruso is not the Alex Caruso that we've seen. And well, defensively, he's still having a really good season. Mm. And he's still that kind of like 
point of attack terrier. Mm. But the the offensive game has just fallen off a cliff. And that's what I mean about like he's you know his point of attack defense isn't solving any problems for the Bulls, but having him on the court because he's good at defense is creating a heap of problems for the offense. To you know to wit, th- this team just doesn't shoot threes. <laughs> they they're ranking uh, for the season they're twelfth in three point percentage which is good it's respectable it's what you would probably expect when you've got a three-point shooting big you've got a couple of like you know theoretical sharpshooters Levine Kobe White but they're taking the least in the NBA per game and they're 27th in max Mm. they're first in mid-range scoring but they're 24th in points in the paint. Mm. So they're not scoring threes and they're not getting into the paint. And and it's, I mean, obviously Maury Ball, but it's a little bit more excusable given their personnel having Vooch and DeRozan, well, but not that DeRozan bad. is having a great mid-range shooting season again, but Vooch isn't. Mm. And Vooch being, like Vooch being in this no-man's land of wanting to operate out of the post, um, there's there's not like, also, there's also not incredible movement on this team. So it's not like Vooch is some... Jokic, you know, whilst Vooch is a good passer, not uncommon to see him get four, five, six assists mm. a night. Mm. Uh, it's not like he's Jokic at the center of a whirring machine with parts moving all around him and he just needs to find the right dump off pass to the, the cutter who gets a dunk. Like, mm. that's not really happening either. Mm. So they've got two of their three, their big threats living in the mid range and they're not getting threes and they're not getting easy looks at the rim out of it. So it's awesome that. DeRozan shooting 48% for mid-range. Mm. It's awesome that he's propelling them to lead in the league in that stat, but you're not actually getting anything other than two points a little less than half the time, mm. which in today's NBA, that's just not as valuable. And that's when you kind of start to think to bring it back to Billy Donovan. Like, there's obvious, there's obvious problems that need to be solved with this team, but there's also opportunities for innovation and for a creative approach that we've seen some other teams take Mm. and Billy Donovan is doing you know what seems to be like a bad coaching job because not figuring out how to fit these players together is as much a coaching issue as it is like a roster building issue and our tourist kind of sobers Mm. pushing the chips in for a big three that maybe don't gel like it's kind of the coach's job to take like a an innovative offensive approach and say how can we fit these people together Mm. and it was working for a little bit last season when Lonzo was healthy and Caruso was playing really well and they were running you know pick and rolls with the second unit and Derek Jones Jr. was just dunking over everyone and Caruso and Lonzo were throwing lobs in transition Mm. and now that that like harassing half court D is gone and the transition opportunities are drying up. You're actually just saying a, a, a not a very creative and not a very effective offensive team. Mm. Um, let's move off the court and move a little bit to the rumors. Um, according to Eric Pincus I of love the rumors. <laughs> according to Eric Pincus of Bleacher Report, rival teams are currently quote watching the Chicago situ- situation very closely unquote. Um, there was a follow-up report from someone who I can't remember and haven't written down that Arturis Karnaschovas is not entertaining any trade offers. Zach Levine of ESPN on his podcast said that the Lakers are currently interested in a DeMar and Vooch trade package. Who said that? Zach, Zach Lowe. Zach Lowe. What, what? Zach Levine. <laughs> and I was like, is Zach Levine doing an ESPN podcast and giving out Chicago Bulls scoops? Zach Lowe. Um, tr- <laughs> the, the trade would be based around... Um, simply just Russell Westbrook and those two picks the old faithful for people yeah. <laughs> for people who can't see the audio form podcast I'm opening up the Spongebob old faithful <laughs> which would be the 27th and 29th overall pick I'm sure you could throw Kendrick Nunn in there because he's also an old yeah, faithful he's got to be in there Kendrick Nunn is the heir to Taylor and Horton Tucker as um, the, the Lakers old faithful trade offer and then Adrian Wojnarowski CAA client of ESPN as well <laughs> was carrying the water for a former CEA um, a worker Leon Rose also yeah. known as the Knicks a fucking president of executive of GMs yeah. um, saying that a CAA client Zach Levine might be interested in joining the CAA Knicks yeah. um, again that's coming from the CAA Wojnarowski um, so we know that the Knicks had an offer on the table uh, for Donovan Mitchell Maybe just pull back a little bit and say, "Oh, well, that's that's our Levine offer as well." So there are there are moves out there, and there are realistic moves out there that can be made. 
Um, it's just Arturis Karnaschovas has shown no interest. Definitely, there, it was reported that he showed no interest in the Russell Westbrook deal. Um, and reading between the lines, I, I don't know why he would want to tear it all down because it is just so risky to say, fingers crossed, I hope we get that top four pick. So then in the article I asked, well, that just doesn't seem like a rational business move, even though it might be the right thing to do. Is there a way they can go in the other direction? Is there a way the Bulls can say, okay, we've dug ourselves a hole, maybe DeMar DeRozan falls off two years from now, but we've got this two-year window of being the sixth fucking seed. So we're digging this hole. Can we just dig a little bit deeper and then bury ourselves? So would you be interested if you were the Chicago Bulls GM and your boss come to you and said, hey, I need you to make the playoffs this year. Would you be interested in throwing more picks? Would this be reasonable to throw more picks into the deal for, I'll mention some of the names and maybe we can talk about some of the potential deals, but for Jay Crowder, Miles Turner, John Collins, Eric Gordon, Sadiq Bey, or Boyan Bogdanovich. Would any of those dudes, I mean, Boyan Bogdanovich having a career year in Detroit, um, can you imagine what it would do to, to what it would do to opposing defenses and what it would do to your own defense, having Levine, Bogdanovich, Vooch, and Demar Rosen on the court at the same time? Well, I mean, he of the names you've mentioned is the most, seems to be, to me to be the most logical. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, it. it I say that because he's the exact sort of fluid, malleable offensive player that could maybe give also, a bit of juice. An, also an above 30-year-old. <laughs> an above 30-year-old white guy. Uh, he could maybe give this offense a little bit of juice, and we know what he can do as a shooter. But I, I don't think that there's like a... I don't think it's necessarily just like a personnel problem. Yeah. Like, like this team is taking the least taking the least amount of threes in the league. If they bring in a shooter, that's not just going to bump up to, you know to 15%. Mm, mm. Bojan Bogdanovich might just end up shooting three Worse. threes less per game and he's shooting 45% on three. Awesome. But he's only taking four a game and mm. that caps the value. And none of the other guys really, you know, Turner is a non-starter unless you're sending Vucevic out because they just absolutely well, cannot play together. Well, that was my next question. What about Turner for Vooch and Pat Williams? I mean, fuck, considering where Pat Williams was being touted in terms of his potential and his potential trade value, and considering that he was the fourth overall pick two drafts ago... Who says no? Because you might have a George Michael I award winner Bulls, in your hands. I think the Bulls... I think, I think both teams say no. I think the Bulls say no from a PR perspective. <laughs> Which is not how you run a fucking basketball team. No, but team. You, you can't... Oh, I, I, I mean, no, it's it's not. But that that's a bad look. If, you're, if you're the Pacers and you just want to make the eight seed every year while Herb Simon sits courtside and watches the eight seed play mm. basketball, um, wouldn't you want Vooch, the perennial eight seed maker? But I mean, Miles Turner is not far off being a perennial eight seed maker. You know? <laughs> He's like a perennial 11th seed maker. At least with Miles Turner, you can kind of say, okay, like we have a de- defensive theory. I don't know what the fuck you're doing with Vooch. <laughs> um, no, I think both teams would say no. But like Sadiq Bay, we talked about a few weeks ago, is you know been made available quietly by Detroit, yeah, and, and yeah. he's not really a, a needle mover unless he suddenly remembers how to shoot and play D, which is kind of two thirds of the game. Jay Crowder, you know, Jay Crowder is, I think, very much going to exercise can his, I, can I ask his you right to play here? for a contender. Nah, I don't care what he thinks. He doesn't have a no trade clause. What would you, like, who says no? Caruso for Jay Crowder and two seconds. There's two seconds coming from Phoenix. I think Phoenix says no. Really? Because yeah. Alex Cruz, just, you can just fuck off Damien Lee. We're just going to have the same conversation every time we talk about Jay Crowder, though, because, because I'm... I'm <laughs> yeah, he's, he's not good, but in, I'm ter- in terms... I'm <laughs> saying that I think we should be looking at a... We should, we, we should be looking at a big art man and yeah, adding, another, yeah. adding another guard to the mix. I know, but this might if be we, the best smaller man we'll ever Ma- get. If we add another guard to the mix and he brings, like, a superlative skill, mm. then yes... Alex Caruso is great as he is on D. Like, you, you, it's just not that much of a needle mover. But you know how Chris Paul is now, he's just going to miss, like, Shit. he's just going to miss 50% of the season, right? Yeah. 
Would you much rather start Alex Caruso instead of Campaign and have Campaign off the bench for all those games that Chris Paul misses? Campaign's actually played pretty well in Chris yeah. Paul's absence. I mean, he's definitely still Campaign, but like, I don't, <laughs> I'm not looking at that and being like, wow, we really need to upgrade the backup point guard mm. spot. Also, like, Caruso is, Caruso is not a point guard. Caruso is a two. Yeah. So yeah. that having. Caruso just but hypothetically in terms, of, in terms if, of your starting lineup you've got like Devin Booker I know no, I, I know, know you're scarred from having him be the playmaker back in the early Kobo days but yeah. now he can do it well now he can do it but you don't necessarily want him to do it whereas with campaign he can do it but he doesn't have to do it yeah you know <laughs> it's just two dudes I'm out just on, deflecting I'm out on <laughs> I'm out on that trade uh, and who was the last there was someone else's that you mentioned uh, another name in there that you mentioned for the Bulls John Collins I don't believe no. it Eric Gordon but you've already oh, got Eric, scoring Eric guards Gordon, nah yeah. I don't I don't want yeah. to I don't want to talk about that there's no the, the, the problem this is the crux of the problem if I can summarise it for the Bulls on the court is the fact that their big three are not complimentary and then outside of that their role players are also not complimentary but the nature of complimentary role players is that it's not just one it's like you need a few of them so there's no move they can make for a peripheral guy no move they can make for a role player for a fifth starter or a bench player that is going to come in and reset the paradigm because you're still going to have Dasumnu is just a good backup point guard. Caruso is having a down year, can't shoot. Pat Williams doesn't shoot. Um, Kobe White, bad. Like You're not getting one guy in here who's going to reorient everything. Your problems are more multifaceted. So if you are looking to make those moves, you're going to need to make two or three trades and really rejig your surrounding pieces. Otherwise, it has to be one of the big three. And that can, you know, mentioned before they're all in their own way like at the kind of nadir of their trade value and Mm. you're not going to get back what you want or what you would hope for to kick off a a healthy and successful rebuild especially not when you compare to what teams have gotten in the last three seasons when Mm. they've decided to kick off their successful and healthy rebuild talking about like a you know a Utah or New Orleans sized haul for a star player even the Spurs who don't have that massive haul they still have Atlanta's future and they still have Chicago's they've, 20, got, their own, they've got Chicago's 2024 they've got their own picks round. and other teams picks Chicago owes 20, 20 23 and 25 25 which is top 10 protected um for a sign and trade for oh, for Demar Derozan, yeah. who yes, he's he's lived up to that contract, but the only uh, he met with the Clippers to sign the taxpayer MLE. Mm-hmm. He met with the Clippers to sign the taxpayer. He was coming to terms with signing. A he taxpayer thought he was MLA. going to the Lakers via trade as well. And then and then he just and then Chicago are like, oh, okay, we'll sign you way above your market value, but we're going to give up a first round pick. Yeah. Um. It's. Look, the last sentence I've written here in the section is what would we do? And we've talked about it a little bit, but it is such a dire, depressing situation. Um, it's... it's. It, uh, Remember when a few seasons ago when Arturo kind of showed us Big Artie Big came Artie. into the job? And I remember you were very optimistic because he's come from Denver and he's been in the Nuggets organization. I thought he was going to focus on development. He's been suckled at the teat <laughs> of Masai Ujiri and the bloke that's in Minnesota. Tim Connolly. The guy that bought you a beer. The guy that bought me he's a beer. He's suckled at the bosom of two of the best GMs in the league, and mm. you were very optimistic. I was so optimistic. And he's, done, he's come in and he's done a really bad job. Like, <laughs> <laughs> the you know like the the, the the last little sentence in here in our in our fun run sheet what would what would we do there's no answer because this is a catch 22 scenario for the bulls mm. the best answer i think is to continue play out the string a little bit longer and hope that the answer becomes more obvious because at 11 and 16 you could maybe talk yourself into a playoff run still if that balloons out to 15 and 24 17 and 29 it's pretty obvious that that's not happening. And hopefully for our tourist kind of service, that illuminates the pathway. I think the, look, I, I understand where you're going and you're being very depressing. But the one thing is that out of that middle pack that I mentioned at the start of this segment, no one's made a move yet. Like the, you know, the, the wizards haven't said, are we going for it or we're not going for it? Like no one else around you has made a decision yet. 
if you do want to like grab some morsel of value or some morsel of hope, it's that you can be the first to act. They can't. They can't do that. <laughs> it's that's too great of a risk to go and try and strip the roster and tank. Is that what you mean? Make a move either for way, tanking either or make way. a move for the playoffs? Either way, you can just be the first to move. They can't tank. They can't tank this year because of that, because like the flattened draft odds saying we have to be pick it's one through four and the risk that you're going to turn or you're going to be bad and then turn over the fifth or sixth overall pick like that's too great of a risk but i don't the, think anyone could stomach that risk but the height might be the best it might be the highest highest value you could find but oh uh, yeah i get i get i, I mean get, like I looking at the standings like looking at the standings now like they're already four and a half games between the worst teams and, in the East. and some of the worst teams like the detroit pistons Cade cunningham out for out for the rest of the season yeah. after shin surgery yeah look at you not making eye contact because you didn't want to mention it <laughs> <laughs> there's the You've bad very well to slip that in there the bad teams are losing games the and bad, they're going to continue to lose the bad games. teams are bad they've got that head start and no matter what the bulls do unless they trade all three of their fucking big three on the same day that's going to be a staggered steady decline for them if they decide to go bad Mm, mm. whereas the bad teams are already bad so let's head to a break but hearing you talk about Tim Connolly just made me remember something I had a dream the other day where obviously since we've joined the Basketball Forever podcast network which is an amazing piece of news you should check out what Basketball Forever do um, I was just thinking oh well now we've got this like this little bit extra of an audience who just don't know the history of what we've done. So when you mentioned that Tim Connolly bought me a beer, they might be like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> and then I was like, what are some other stories that we will just mention in passing that people will be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Um, Tim Connolly sponsored a Denver Nuggets watch party in Melbourne. So, and he paid for a $500 tab. So I, I say he bought me a beer. But we've got the Anna Horford beef, which has been quashed, and she's always welcome on the pod. when Anna Horford made the little dick emoji to you <laughs> on, on Twitter? Anna Horford, Al, sister, Al Horford's sister. Um, yeah, which I thought was his wife for so long. Yeah, um, wife makes sense. <laughs> same surname is how it works. But what else is there? What other little stories? There's your cautiously optimistic. Um, that we... we that we love accountability and here at the, the Deep Two. The, fount- the Fountain of McNair. The Fountain of McNair, yeah. Drinking from the Fountain of McNair. And I hope we can start suckle on the teat of Masai <laughs> Shiri. <laughs> I will be suckling on that. <laughs> um, just, are there any other stories before we head to a break? No, I mean, I mean I'm, 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 I'm on the spot here. There definitely mm. are little inside jokes that we mentioned in passing that new listeners might not be familiar we should, with. We should, so maybe we should just, next time we mention one, we should just do like a little expose, like a 30 second aside, mm. just to explain the context a little bit. But at the same time, for you know any new listeners that are along for the ride, rest assured, there'll be plenty of new inside jokes coming up all the time, <laughs> a la suckling at the teeth. <laughs> so... Even if it's not immediately obvious what the little giggles are for, strap in, because there's more coming. French kid, that's another one. Some French kid. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's take a break and come back in a second. The depth, the, the deep, the, uh, the deep two. God, that's a mouthful. Anyways, I'm Marco, co-host of the... Hey, Daniel Gafford, what's the name of our podcast? The JVG NBA Tribute Show. Well, I can't believe it's that easy. Thanks, Gaff. You probably know us as two members of the Four Man Weave plus Marco, but we know you as our next listener. Well said, Lucas. I gotta ask, how do we differ from the pack of basketball podcasts? It's a great question, Marco. You see, on our basketball podcast, we have two male co-hosts. Wow, truly groundbreaking. After this episode, stay on your favourite podcasting app and give us a spin. And we are back to wrap up just a little bit of news for the week. Um, news for the fortnight. News for the fortnight. So we'll start off with this coming from Jonathan Fagan of the Houston Chronicle, saying that the Houston Rockets have discussed an Eric Gordon deal with about six teams. Um, this is funny. I love how they just mentioned the fact that there's six teams. I've n- we've never seen a report like this. Uh, one of the teams that has been reported are the Phoenix Suns. That's actually been quite big in the news uh, because obviously you've got Jay Crowder who you need, you need to get off. You already mentioned this before when we talked about Alex Caruso, but you need big bodies. You don't need scoring guards, as we know. Even defensive guards, you're actually fine on that front. Um, what do you think about uh, a potential Eric Gordon deal? I'm apoplectic. <laughs> it does nothing 
for me. Yeah, cool. Um, I just got nothing. Although it would be, it would be, if you went back in time ten years to the summer of two thousand and twelve, winter for us, and you told how old was I was fifteen, fourteen years old in two thousand and twelve, this in winter. If you told me then, when Eric Gordon had signed an offer sheet with the Suns at the start of that free agency which was a five day waiting period back then if you came to me and said Eric Gordon's going to play for the Suns I would have been over the moon <laughs> and then if you told me straight after that but it's going to be in 2022 I probably would have had a different reaction <laughs> um, fun fact he, he wanted to sign with the Suns but the, the New Orleans Hornets matched but the reason why Eric Gordon didn't want them to match is because they had just drafted Austin Rivers. Mm. Fun little fact. Another fun little fact. I'm full of fun little facts. I'm like the little fucking fruit juice. It's a fun little man. Uh, Eric Gordon um, played under Monty Williams when he was with those Hornets. Um, that's my last little fact. If, 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 uh, if as has been maybe bandied about a little bit in the darker circles of the NBA commentary... <laughs> Kenyon Munn Jr. is yeah. in this trade. Yeah. Even if the Suns send back a second round pick or two, that would be so good. Then and I'd he, be then I'd be saying let's pull the sugar. On it this would one. be like the sixth or seventh man on a title team. I could see that happen. Yeah. Especially if he was with you guys. Yeah. Um. Uh. Fuck. I, oh, obviously, Eric Gordon has that strange contract that he signed under um, Del Mori, where he's twenty million dollars absolute fully non-guaranteed unless his team wins the NBA finals yeah um, so let me just do a quick Google search of the Rockets record okay probably no not a lot of risk of that happening um, ha, ha, ha. but yes <laughs> if he does get traded you might have 20 million dollars 20 extra million dollars on your book alright next piece of news um, the Detroit Pistons are looking to trade Nerlens Noel with the Blazers Heat Kings and Mavs interested coming from James Edwards the third of The Athletic so far this season Nerlens Noel has played in 6 games and he's averaging just over 10 minutes a night and shooting 31% from the floor what number does that start with that's another uh, one, inside joke 1, 2, 3 yeah it is, is it? Should we explain it or is that nah, self-explanatory? Nah, nah, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, obviously, you're training for the Nerlens Noel of old, who he, he missed the start of the season with an injury. Um, I think he's a fine backup in the league. Damn, now that now that you say it, we probably don't need to mention all these things. But the next one we can talk about. Well, I mean, don't peel back the curtain too hard, but like <laughs> this is exactly what I was saying before we started the episode. <laughs> no, nah, but just on Nerlens Noel, is, is he, he, he signed a three-year, $10 million... Uh, extension with the Knicks a few seasons ago. Is this the third season? Let me just jump on Spot Track. Um, also, just whilst we're talking about Spot Track, uh, Danny LaRue, your favorite podcaster, is on my radar because of the way that he says Spo Track. He says no. Spo Track. He says Spo Track. It's obviously Spot Track. It's phonetic. Don't overcomplicate it. Anyway, Nerlens Noel is in the second year of that of three-year three year $27 million deal he signed with the Knicks. Any options? Uh, no, no options. Right. Um, oh, no, I lied. <laughs> Team option on the third. Right, right, right. So he, you could trade for him and cut him loose, or you could pick him up at 10 million for next year, which, to be honest, even in this cap-rich environment, 10 mil for Nerlens Noel is pretty fucking rich uh, at the time it was quite fine he had a great season for the Knicks and then he didn't he actually wasn't even that good that season true I would rather have and uh, they I, had... I'd rather have Isaiah Hartenstein yeah well I mean you know exhibit A exactly right. although I, you know after carrying me <laughs> through the first three weeks of the fantasy season Isaiah Hartenstein's dropped off well he's he, I, I said it on this pod he's, he, his confidence was hit when um, Mitch Robinson went down and they started Jericho Sims ahead of him yeah anyway uh, next piece of news which, which we, but hold on, hold on. I'm just I'm peeling back the curtain now if purity we're two layers into the curtain the curtain's been peeled you, know, you do not want to see what's behind the third layer <laughs> but you, you've advocated for keeping Nerlens Noel here let's him let's where? have a in, in the podcast we're talking about him so let's <laughs> talk about him would you you're any of these teams with the Blazers Heat and Heat Kings and Mavs are you looking at Nerlens Noel with any seriousness do yeah, you think he'd yeah. make your team better 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. But yeah, all of them or, not, or or just the ones that have bad backup centers. Yeah. <laughs> but he is a backup. Yeah. Um Is Big Jim too much to trade? Oh shit. <laughs> because he's also on ten mil. Go back to two thousand and nineteen and say that sentence. <laughs> say that sentence. <laughs> you know, if we just trade Big Jim into I don't know, San Antonio's cap space, mm. um we will save seventy million dollars in tax. Well you fucking probably should just do that. This then. year. This year. <laughs> That's not even next year's money. Far out. That is depressing. Um, he would be good on the Mavs, I think, but... Big Jim. <laughs> <laughs> he fucking obviously, would. Obviously. <laughs> obviously not. Noel on the Mavs. Shore up that backup big spot, but then you'd be looking at JaVale McGee and Nerlens Noel as your backup bigs, and that's a lot of money to be... That's $16 million for your backup <laughs> bigs, which is a lot of money. <laughs> Potentially, you know, five years ago, you would have been saying sixteen million is too much for your starting center, and now we're now we're talking about sixteen million being more, you know, for more multiple than backups. For your backup bids, but it all definitely right. is. Next piece of news: um, the NBA, as we mentioned at the start, has renamed all of its major awards. Um, just coming from the NBA's PR machine. Talk about Michael Jordan Award, Kim Large One Trophy, ETC, ETC. There is a new award. Um, called the Jerry West Trophy, which is awarded to the most clutch player of the year. Of the playoffs or of, of the, the regular year? Of the regular season. So would you calculating this by buzzer beaters, mate? Uh, obviously. Or are we looking at clutch, clutch performance? Scoring. They're looking at clutch mm. scoring, the metric. Um, just like, say what you will about the award. It's fine. How but the fuck they didn't name it after like Kobe? How the fuck they're not just going to wait to do this in a couple of years after Damian Lillard? Yeah. Like it's... Who was, it's 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 cringe, right? Who was it? But surely it's just Damien. It's it is Damien Lillard's award. Yeah, it should be. It is. It, it no, it should be. Wait five years and then do it, or just <laughs> introduce the award and call it the most clutch player of the year award. You know, <laughs> we'll just do it now. Just call it the Damien Lillard award. That would be the biggest flex in the whole world. Who was it that was like five? Five to six years ago, there was like some like good, not great NBA player who was actually like the greatest clutch scorer in the league for like. A few seasons. It does ring a bell. You don't know who it was. I think it was Joe Johnson. Yeah. It was ISO Joe. Yeah. It was just like, like I guess that's how shooting fifty eight percent on, you know, like you know, multiple attempts in the clutch with a couple of buzzer beaters. Um I've just Googled it, obviously I didn't find it by typing in NBA clutch scorer. But using the clutch metric now yeah I don't, I'm not even going to look at how they're doing this but obviously after the announcement of the award they said who's the most clutch player right now there are eight names in front of me can you tell me you can you can either guess who's the most clutch player or just one of them oh, Who- I'm just going to try and get one is Stephen Curry on the list Stephen Curry is seventh okay well then that's enough for me I don't okay. need to embarrass myself further so it's seventh Steph Curry then Zion Really? Kevin Durant? Yeah. DeMar DeRozan? Yeah. Anthony Simons? <laughs> Hold on. Blazers, Blazers guard one? <laughs> Jeremy Grant? <laughs> can you guess the Don't. most Can you guess the most clutch player? Can I say the gap between 1 and 2 is twice as big between 2 and 3? So yeah. this is the most clutch player by a long way. The most clutch player by a long way this season. I'll give you a clue. It's not Dame. Okay. Well, I wasn't going to say Dame. After Jeremy Grant got in there, <laughs> there's no way I was saying three blazers at the top. Oh, I don't know. Giannis. So it's Shea Gilgis Alexander. Oh. All right. Let's move on. Um, okay. So this happened last week, which we were going to talk about right before the, the non-COVID illness pod. Bradley Beal went on the Gilbert Arenas pod uh, and said that the absence of contenders in free agency led him to re-signing with the Wizards. I'll read out his quote. Quote, on the business side of it, there were no teams on the market, just free agency-wise. I'm just being frank. There was nowhere else for me to go. Where I can go to win? There were teams that strategically wasn't what I wanted. Realistically, I won't say my hand was forced, but this was the best option that was on the table. Unquote. I read that quite poorly, actually. <laughs> but no, I think Bradley, Bradley Beal pretty much said, I wanted to go elsewhere. There were no contenders out there who could give me what I wanted. I'm assuming he means a maximum contract. Um, so he said, I guess I just have to return to these wizards. He obviously did the whole PR thing, saying, I want to be a wizard for life. I want to retire with this team. They drafted me. I reckon I can win a championship here. 
but then he went on a podcast 20, 25 games into the NBA season and said, nah, that, that wasn't true. Yeah. And when this whole Supermax situation, which Bradley Bill is on the Supermax situation, he's got, I'm not going to jump onto Spo track and look it up, but his contract is somewhere in the vicinity of $250 million over five years. Yeah. <laughs> to see the math on that, fifty million dollars a year. When that was first being bandied about, he had kind of put up two consecutive seasons of scoring over thirty points. The who were the only people in the last since I've been watching basketball to do that? It's him and James Harden to have mm. two consecutive seasons of scoring over thirty points. So it can't be overstated what a tremendous accomplishment that is from a pure perspective of putting the ball in the basket. Last season, he had kind of an injury-riddled, inconsistent year in which he kind of dropped back down um, in terms of his offensive output and his overall play. Got the bag anyway. Now, this season, the Wizards are kind of really bad. Seem like a bit of a mess. On the court, in the front office, this cunt's going on fucking Gilbert Arenas' podcast. I could stop you there and tell you that that's a bad situation before I even hear what he says. Bradley Bale is averaging 23 points on an efficient 52 from the field, shooting 60% on twos. That's great. He's averaging 23 points a game <laughs> in the same amount of minutes as he previously was averaging 30. The team is not better for him taking the back seat. And that brings his points per game to less than 50% of his millions per year in his contract. You should not be getting paid $50 million a year if your points per game number is not at least 50% of that. <laughs> 25 points per game is the minimum for you to be able to be paid $50 million a year. And he's not meeting that benchmark right now. So that is a completely meaningless and arbitrary designation. Mm. But the Wizards bad. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just want to... I just want to apologize a bit because when he signed this deal, you were immediately on on the offensive saying, he got the no-trade clause. He just wants to go wherever he wants to go. He just wants the bag. And I said, no, give it a minute. They've obviously like traded for Bazingas. Cole Kuzma looks good. They have the foundation of like being a fine team. Um, and I said, let's not just assume that he wants to leave. Like, you know, there is something to be said for maybe he does want to stay with the one team forever. Um yeah, it's just he's he has simply said that that's not the case. <laughs> that's he's, actually not out. He I'm said, down. "Sean, no, you're wrong there, and I, I thank you for your faith, but um, Sean, no." But you were you were wrong yeah. Yeah, when you put your faith in me. Um, cool. All right. Final piece of news: TJ Warren returned to the basketball court. Uh, first time he's done so since the bubble. Um, do you remember sitting on that fold-out bed when I'd first moved into my first house after moving out? That was the last fucking time TJ Warren played basketball. <laughs> You've been to Perth and back since then. It, that's two and a half years ago at this point. <laughs> it's seriously, that's like, we're talking like the middle of 2020. Welcome back. Um, last time he played, he was one of the best players on the planet. Now, he's just a very good signing for a Nets team. Great, great value. He did put up fucking 50 points in the bubble and was averaging 35. <laughs> yeah, and did that LeBron stare. Yeah, goddamn TJ Warren on the fucking... Uh, sons back in the day mm. what might have been cash considerations yeah seriously um, seriously I've done something real silly here <laughs> Dante I will speak to you next week hey it's been real fun. We were over the moon when we first heard that the NBA was going to be televised on Australian free-to-air TV in the 2019-20 season. It didn't exactly go swimmingly with the nasty cough halting the season and games getting cancelled left, right and centre, but it was a huge step and an exciting one for basketball fans all across the country. Better yet, it wasn't a commercial channel cashing in on some basketball nerds like us. It was SBS, one of our public broadcasters. Unfortunately, the NBA wasn't the only thing SBS was pushing last season. They also ran advertisements from Sportsbet, Ladbroke, Bet365, Bet Easy, and Neds, some of the biggest sports betting companies in Australia. In a one step forwards, two steps backwards move, SBS has dropped the ball here. As a public broadcaster, SBS plays a key role in providing relevant, culturally appropriate health information to local communities. 
The last thing SBS should be doing is offering a platform for gambling companies during the most financially unstable time in recent memory. This past year, men aged 18 to 24 made up 79% of new gambling account holders with increased median spending and frequency of bets. This is the last thing we should be spending our money on given the financial uncertainty that comes with the pandemic. During COVID lockdowns, wagering companies spent more money on advertising and incentives to gamble, and it worked. SBS needs to hear from viewers that gambling ad revenue isn't worth the harm it causes. Call on the SBS chair, George Savitas, to put community health ahead of gambling revenue by signing the petition at www.endgamblingads.org.au forward slash get gambling off SBS with hyphens in between.